modern information technology undermines our financial, economic and political systems. The 20th century was dominated by a gigantic, the global power struggle between communism, fascism and liberalism. At the end of the 20th century, Western liberalism was a clear winner for the time being. Democracy, free market economy and human rights seem to be on the rise worldwide. But a lot has happened since then. Time for an inventory. At the beginning of the 21st century, it is terribly bad for the once brilliant winner. The culprit is the technological revolution. Computer technology has radically changed our world since the 1990s. Yet today, few politicians seem to be able to grasp, let alone control, the magnitude of change. Take the example of the financial world. The computers have made our global financial system so complicated and cryptic that only a small group of people understand how it really works. The faster the development of artificial intelligence progresses, the sooner we approach a point where the processing of financial data could ultimately transcend human imagination. It is hard to imagine what it means for political decision making. Imagine a future in which our government's budgets and tax reforms are approached by algorithms. Unfortunately, dealing with these disruptive technologies is still not on the agenda for most politicians today. In the US election campaign 2016, Neither Trump nor Clinton addressed the effects of automation on the American labor market. Strictly speaking, disruptive technologies were only once in the center of attention, in the context of Hillary Clinton's email affair. This ignorance causes many voters to lose faith in the political establishment. More and more people in Western democracies feel useless in the brave new world of smart machines. And it is precisely this fear of insignificance that drives them to cling desperately to any form of political power that remains to them. Before it is too late. That is precisely why the 2016 political earthquakes were the cause. Both Brexit and Donald Trump's election were supported by normal people who fear that the liberal world might depend on them. In the 20th century, Ordinary employees were afraid that the economic elites could exploit their labor power. At the beginning of the 21st century, people worry about the complete loss of their social status in a high-tech economy that simply does not need it anymore. New developments in the field of neuroscience allow computers to take over our jobs. As experts agree that robotics and machine learning will overturn nearly all professions over the course of the 21st century. Nobody knows what that means. Will billions of people simply be replaced by machines in the coming decades? And even if, are we all going to be poor or do we just have more time for a better life and better new jobs? Optimists like to point to the Industrial Revolution in the, 19, in the late 19th century. Even then, there was a fear that the new machines could push people into mass unemployment. In retrospect, the progress believers say that the new machines would have created a new job for every job they made obsolete. However, there is good reason to believe that the technological revolution in the 21st century will have a significantly more destructive impact on human working life. For this, we first have to look at which economically utilizable abilities a human being possesses. Cognitive and physical. During the Industrial Revolution, human labor was only threatened by machines in the area of physical competences. Our cognitive abilities were vastly superior to the apparatus. This means that while many manual activities in industry and agriculture have since been automated, at the same time, new jobs have constantly emerged in which people's cognitive skills were in demand. For example, the ability to analyze, communicate or learn. But here we go. In the 21st century, the machines are becoming increasingly smart enough to take the edge of cognitive activities. Neuroscience has recently found that many of our choices, likes and emotions are not due to a magical human trait such as free will or the famous good feeling. It looks as if human perception is a byproduct of our neural capacity to recognize patterns and calculate different probabilities within fractions of a second. This, of course, leads to an uncomfortable question. 
Will we use this knowledge to build such good artificial intelligence that sooner or later it will also be used in occupations with human intuition, such as human intuition, out to the jurisdiction or the banking? The probability is high. It is conceivable that computers will still decide on the credit worthiness in the 21st century or that they will check the truth of statements made by lawyers in court proceedings. One could also say that even in the near future, even the most cognitively demanding jobs are no longer safe from automation. The polarization of the immigration debate threatens to divide the European Union. The world has never looked so small today. The 21st century has brought about changes that former generations would never have dreamed of. Globalization has made the borders around the globe softer and more porous so that today people from all over the world are meeting each other. This also leads to completely new types of conflicts. The more people are crossing national borders in search of better living conditions, the greater the tendency of large sections of the population to reject strangers or force them to adapt to culture. These tendencies put our political ideologies and national identities on the hardest of all samples. This is especially true for Europe. The European Union emerged in the 20th century from the ambition of European states such as France and the Federal Republic of Germany to overcome cultural conflicts and conflicts. Ironically, at the beginning of the 21st century, the very failure of the EU to absorb the cultural differences between EU citizens and new immigrants from the Middle East and North Africa threatens the survival of the entire project. The issue of dealing with the growing number of those seeking protection from these countries has sparked a bitter debate over tolerance and cultural identity. There is a basic consensus that immigrants should seek to integrate into the culture of their new homelands. How far this integration should go is subject of ongoing discussions. Some political groups are are of the opinion that newcomers should completely strip off their previous cultural identity, including traditional clothing and food offerings. They also think that immigrants from patriarchal or strongly religious countries would have to take over the emancipatory and secular values of European society. The proponents of immigration to Europe, however, insist on the founding idea of the EU. By its vast range of values and habits, Europe is so culturally diverse by nature that we cannot ask anyone to adapt to the abstract notion of a collective identity to which we do not refer ourselves. They believe that we cannot force Muslim migrants to convert to Christianity if, for example, the majority of Britons or Germans no longer go to church themselves. And they question why, for example. British immigrants from the former British colonies of India should eat British dishes instead of their traditional curries when most Britons tend to sit in an Indian restaurant after work rather than in the fish and chips frying salon. There is simply no clear answer to the question of the degree of cultural integration. A lesson for the 21st century, therefore, is that we should not portray this debate as a moral cultural struggle in which right-wing immigration opponents fight on the one hand and migration advocates on the other, who allegedly evoke the death of the West. Instead, we should treat the handling of such an important challenge respectfully, because ultimately, both political perspectives have their justification. Terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda are true masters of manipulation. Another urgent topic of the 21st century is the handling of terrorism. The fear is out of proportion to the actual threat. Evidence complacent. Since the attacks of 9-11, an average of 50 people are killed each year in terrorist attacks in Europe. There are about 10 in the US. In the same period, 80,000 people died in traffic accidents in Europe and over 40,000 in the US. If our daily journey to work is a much more realistic threat, why are we more afraid of terrorists in the West than in cars? Because terrorists are absolute masters of manipulation. For the mostly weak and desperate splinter groups, terrorism is the last remaining strategy for influencing the political situation. They want to sow terror and fear in the hearts of their opponents, because they lack the means to do real material damage. And if you look at the history of 21st century so far, the tactic proves to be mercilessly effective. Example 9 11. Al Qaeda killed 3,000 New Yorkers and plunged the main US Metro Police in, into chaos for days. This was undoubtedly horrific. 
from a purely military point of view, however, the damage was almost zero. The US armed forces had the same number of soldiers, jets, and tanks after the attacks as before. The transport and communication systems of the country were completely intact. The real power of the attack lay in its emotional power. The images of the collapsing Twin Towers burned so deeply into the collective memory that the country was pushing for a gigantic relatory strike. The rest is history. A few days after 9-11, George W. Bush declared war on terror in Afghanistan, the consequences of which continue to affect the entire Middle East today. The plan of the terrorists to destabilize the region had worked out. But how could a comparatively small and weak terrorist group with little military resources provoke the world's greatest superpower into such a disproportionate response? Let's answer that question with with a metaphor. Imagine Al-Qaeda as a housefly waving madly in a china shop. She wants to break something, but cannot even move a coffee cup by herself. That's where she comes up with a much better idea. In the same china shop stands a hot blooded bull. The fly decides to annoy the choleric powerhouse with its annoying buzzing until it loses its composure, and in the hunt for her the whole store is reduced to ashes. Another lesson for the 21st century is that if powerful democratic governments get carried away by disproportionate reactions, the terrorists will win. If we want to fight terror effectively, we must first understand that nothing of what terrorists do can defeat us. The man of the 21st century is far more ignorant than, th- than he thinks. Western man of the 21st century sees himself as a child of the Enlightenment. Our liberal societies are based on an unshakable belief in the ability of individuals to think rationally and, a- and act independently. Our democracy is based on the idea that voters will know what the country needs. In our free market economy, the custom is always right. Our schools see themselves as bastions of independent thinking. But what if we overestimate ourselves? What if it is a mistake to keep such a big piece on our highly praised ratio? In fact, the person of the 21st century knows scarily little about how the world really works. In the Stone Age, almost everyone knew how to procure food, process animal skin into clothing, and light a fire. The modern man is much less self-sufficient. The problem is, he does not know. We think ourselves a thousand times smarter than our ancestors, and we depend on the help of specialists from food procurement to clothing in almost all situations. A study asked attendees if they were familiar with how an ordinary zipper works. Although almost all participants agreed, only very few were able to explain the simple mechanics. And we are just talking about the zipper here. The lesson for the 21st century. Modern man feels more informed than he is. Science has coined a term illusion of knowledge. We believe we know a lot because we have almost unlimited access to other people's knowledge. We confuse access to information with real knowledge. The illusion of knowledge leads to people in important situations and functions. They rule as voters or government officials. They misjudge the true complexity of the world and are not even aware of it. So it happens that important climate policy decisions are influenced by people who have little or no idea of meteorology. Or that solutions to the conflicts in Ukraine or Iraq are advocated by politicians who will first have to look for them on the map. The next time someone gives their opinion on a topic, just get yourself over how much he really knows about the topic. You may be surprised. 21st century students should not learn more facts, but train their critical thinking. A child born in 2018 will be in his early 30s in 2050 and will hopefully still live in 2100. What kind of education does this generation need to make the 21st century successful? The unfortunate truth is that if today's children are ready to be the leaders of tomorrow, we need to reform our education systems. The school as we know today does not live up to the demands of the 21st century. Our current school system is too eager to stuff its students with knowledge. 
this may have made sense in the 19th century, when access to education was not taken for granted, and there was neither TV nor radio nor the internet. At this time, many snippets of information were state censored or ideologically colored. It is therefore understandable that the modern school system attaches great importance to historical facts or geographic and biological knowledge. The new knowledge meant a dramatic improvement in the living conditions of ordinary people. The living conditions of humans have changed enormously since then. Today we no longer have to struggle with the limited availability, but the gigantic abundance of information. In the 21st century, people around the globe are using smartphones to connect to the net. You can research Wikipedia 24 hours a day, check TED Talks, or attend online seminars. The biggest problem of modern man is no longer the scarcity of information, but the exponentially growing amount of misinformation. Just think of all the fake news that haunts the social media. So one lesson is that education needs to change. In view of the gigantic streams of information, we should not hammer our children into the head even more data in the school. Instead, the children of the 21st century should learn how to figure out all the information they bombard on a daily basis. They should learn how to distinguish between false, irrelevant, and truly relevant information and how to use the unlimited availability of all that knowledge to actually find the truth. Fake news is an ancient phenomenon and gives us the opportunity to cooperate. Surely you do, you do not believe everything you read on Twitter. In modern society, it is full of lies and fictions that some already speak of the so-called era of post-factic. Just think of the controversial information policy of Vladimir Putin. In 2014, Russian special forces invaded the Ukraine Crimea, but Putin has always publicly spoken of government-independent, self-defense groups. Putin himself knew how brazen this lie was. But if we really live in a post-factic age today, when exactly was the era of absolute truth? And when and why did you finish? Through the social media? By Putin? Or Trump? Or Erdogan? A brief look into history is enough to make such a chronological classification absurd. Our perception of the truth has been distorted for quite some time by propaganda, manipulation and disinformation. In 1931, the Japanese military orchestrated fake attacks on their own country in order to legitimize the subsequent offensive against China. Japan went so far as to invent a fictitious country called Manchukuo to justify the invasion. Britain, too, adopted the reality of colonizing Australia in the 19th century to a suitable version. The violent conquest of the populated island continent was rewritten as a legend of the settlement of a supposed deserted no man's lands. Thus, 10,000 years of indigenous cultural history were conveniently removed from the picture. The inconvenient truth is that we always have lived in a post-fact society. We could even go further and say that our species owes all its impressive advancement to its ability to design and then believe fictions. Ever since prehistoric times, people have been finding self-reinforcing myths as communities of values. It is not without reason that we are the only species on the planet that cooperates with strangers. Only we have the ability to credibly tell and spread the right stories at the right moments, so that millions of other people believe in them. First the common belief of a collective society, an overarching narrative leads us to follow appropriate laws and cooperate as a community. Religion is the best example. Just imagine what achievements we owe to religiously connected groups. World religions such as Christianity and Islam are basically based on nothing more than ancient fake news and have led us to build schools, hospitals and bridges. Strengthening community and social cohesion can only succeed offline. Mark Zuckerberg is a man with a mission. The Facebook CEO believes that many of the most pressing issues of our time, from substance abuse to social unrest to the rise of totalitarian regimes, go back to a common cause, the dwindling social cohesion in our society. Therefore, he announced in 2017 in an ambitious manifesto, Facebook wants to strengthen around the globe from now on the sense of community and cohesion. 
But can Facebook really help to build stronger communities? First of all, Zuckerberg has put his finger in the right vents. Fewer and fewer people are involved in social or cultural organizations. In recent decades, groups of all stripes, from football clubs to party political bases, have lost about a quarter of their membership. Unfortunately, Facebook is not the answer. Why? Because real human community only works offline. That's because, contrary to our beliefs, we humans still have the same basic psychological and emotional needs as in the Stone Age. We humans must feel part of a close-knit community to thrive. For thousands of years, we have been living in intimate social groups of, at most, 30 members. Without the connection to this close collective, we unite and alienate ourselves from society. Even today, due to our primitive cognitive disposition, we cannot know more than 150 people in person, no matter how many Facebook friends we have. Therefore, all the attempts of social media companies and political parties to artificially expand our narrow social ties are doomed from the start. No matter how many comrades you have in a party or how many like-minded people you virtually network in private Facebook groups, none of this can replace the warm and physical closeness of a true friend or sibling. This leads us to the following lesson for the 21st century. The intimacy of analog communities is unattainable for the virtual proximity of online communities. Imagine, you live in Tel Aviv and lie in bed with fever. Your Facebook friends in California can comfort you with words and video news. They cannot cook you soup or accompany you on the way to the doctor. If Zuckerberg is really serious about reviving global communities, he will have to think a few more about how he wants to bridge the gap between his world and real life. The advances in biotechnology are putting our free will and privacy at risk. The world as we know today it is, is currently being transformed by two revolution developments. Human biology is about to decipher the last great secrets of the human body. And computer science is working tirelessly on ever more powerful methods of data processing. But when these two revolutions merge, we may experience a blue miracle. Why? Because the result of this symbiosis will be highly intelligent computer programs that know more about your health than any doctor has ever done. This will inevitably lead to an epic transfer of competence from human to computer. In just a few decades, computer programs could be supplied with a constant stream of data and our bodily functions. You could monitor our physical condition around the clock and raise the alarm for even the slightest harbingers of diseases such as cancer, Alzheimer's or influenza, long before we feel that something is wrong. The programs could suggest the best diets, exercise and treatment methods, tailored to the individual's DNA, personality and physique. That may sound like unimaginable medical progress and health. Curiously, our life will then no longer be determined by disease, but even more. There will always be body parts and functions where something is wrong or cannot be improved. People used to feel healthy until they knew they were sick. It, in the 21st century, on the other hand, biosensors could be linked to biometric computer programs that registered their ailments well before the first symptoms. So he will constantly be confronted with some medical problem that he would have to avoid using computer-generated methods. Now you could say, one can simply ignore the measurement results and the recommendations of the computer. But what if someone has the idea of sending the biometric data directly to the state, your employer, health insurance or educator? Imagine losing your job or insurance because you do not follow the recommendations of your medical computer. That will be a disaster for our freedom of action. Every smoker knows the risks of cancer. But how self-determined would you be in a system that warns you of the slightest unreasonableness or not face your boss, your parents, or even the police? That leaves only one lesson for the 21st century. Medical and technological advances should not lead to the disappearance of our right to privacy. That leaves only one lesson for the 21st century. Medical and technological advances should not lead to the disappearance of our right to privacy. 
Climate change is the greatest existential threat of the 21st century. Even in the case after the end of the Cold War, nuclear weapons are the biggest threat on the planet. There is another danger that becomes more and more existent from year to year, the total collapse of our ecosystem. It is particularly disturbing that people are firing this danger in their own right in various ways around the globe. We are ramping up the remaining natural resources and repaying Mother Earth by charging her with gigantic amounts of poison and garbage. The deal is so unfair and dirty that it stinks to the sky, polluting the floors, the water and the air. Take the example of agriculture. Modern farmers fertilize their fields with tons of phosphorus. It can favor the growth of plants in small amounts, but when used excessively, it has a toxic effect on the environment. The phosphorus remains of industrial agriculture pass through the groundwater into the rivers, lakes and seas, where they become a deadly threat to the marine flora and fauna. For example, a maize farmer in the Midwestern United States may unintentionally cause the death of massive schools of fish in the Gulf of Mexico. At the same time, our ecological irresponsibility not only threatens the habitats of other species, unless we change something urgently, we put our own livelihoods in danger. In the course of more than 100,000 years of existence, humans have survived both ice ages and, and heat waves. However, our cities, agriculture, and our more complex forms of social organization have only developed over the past 10,000 years. In this latest section of Earth's history, the Holocene, climatic conditions on Earth, have changed only insignificantly. All the more worrying is that our climate is increasingly deviating from these favorable conditions. Our energy-hungry lifestyle pollutes the atmosphere with as many waste products as carbon dioxide that the global average temperature continues to rise. If we do not radically reduce the global greenhouse gas emissions by 2040, according to climate researchers, the Earth will heat up another 2 degrees Celsius. That sounds like little, but it will have a huge impact. The melting of the polar ice caps, the rise in sea levels, the flooding or desertification of entire areas, and even more natural disasters, such as hurricanes and typhoons. Under such conditions, agriculture will come to a standstill. Large parts of the earth will become uninhabitable and millions of people deprived of their homelands. Even if our species eventually succeeds in adapting to the new climatic conditions, one would not want to imagine how many people will die on the way there. If you want to see more big ideas like this, do not forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.